objectives is here's what we need to do. We, I've been assigned this task of discussing approaches to using GIS in youth education, demonstrating some STEM connections, and showing some examples of what, what youth can actually do. So those are our objectives, and I would love to uh, hear some of your input as well, both today and in the future. So because of our time constraints, we better get right to it. Let's talk about some approaches to using GIS in youth ed education. I feel a little bit humbled by doing this because, again, I, I hold you folks up as the, the model for what needs to be happening. Be all I, I've been at this for kids, uh, but again, we're all learning. That all is to say that I'd like to begin the five forces that are um, important and why we need to be why this is the prime time to be using geotechnologies in education because of these five forces. The five forces are, as you can see here, probably debatable, but these are the five that I believe are the most important and why this is really the prime time to be doing this. A number of us here in this room and those of you out there, you've been at this a while. You've seen the tools change. You've seen other changes. But really, when you think about it, there are a number of things that are acting to give us great hope that this is starting to break out of the educators that are just innovators and early adopters into the early majority. And that could be pretty exciting because it could mean a widespread adoption of some of these things that you and I hold dear. One of them is the geotechnologies themselves. The whole idea of the Internet of Things, for example, more and more objects on the landscape more and more devices being geo-connected, having a location associated with them, means that we're, we're seeing now um, more widespread adoption, easier to use tools, more powerful tools than ever. That's pretty exciting. Having these cloud-based software as a service web GIS tools, I think, are, again, prime opportunities for us as educators to seize the moment. Also, I, I want us to all be involved with uh, discussions on accuracy, privacy, and other things. For example, since we've got this web GIS cloud, how do you know if data is any good? How do you teach students to be critical of data when, oh, there's some easily obtainable low-hanging fruit maps and layers that they can grab and use in their project? How do you know who created it and how they created it and with a date and a scale and all of that stuff that we want them to be uh, critical about? to use but also be critical about the data I think is if, if you can get them to be thoughtful about data I think you've succeeded in many ways and secondly geo awareness we have uh, an aware a growing awareness in the public uh, that all the issues that you and I held dear for years are now starting to be everyday conversations on airplanes and libraries and, and on campuses the things that you and I talked about right sustainability and um, uh, environmental issues, water, energy, natural hazards, population change, those are starting to be public conscious issues. And that's, I think, a good, again, opportunity for us to say, you know what, we actually can help students um, grab with those and, and be aware of those, but also make a contribution to helping us solve some of these vexing, complex issues through some of these things, these methods and tools that we have at our fingertips. So awareness is growing, and also people are becoming enabled to make these differences in their communities, in their regions, in their states, and in their countries. Through having these tools, yes, but also because, of they, because they have a perspective, the geographic perspective. And that goes across all disciplines. It doesn't mean just in geography, right, folks? If, if they're in math class and they're, they're grappling with a problem and they have a spatial awareness of that particular problem, even the age-old problem of a train leaves Cheyenne at 60 miles an hour, or in travels for one hour, and another train leaves Casper, 
what if we visualize that with a web map and draw, drew a buffer around each one of those trains and, and saw where they intersect? So there's a way of spatially enabling these problems. So geo-enablement, having these tools at your fingertips ranging from smartphones to uh, these web GIS tools are enabling people to grapple with these, uh, these technologies in a way that previously was admittedly the innovators, the early adopters, uh, those educators and their students. Now it's, it's much more widespread. So we've got history educators saying, hey, I've heard about those story maps. Uh, can I use those in the classroom? And that's their avenue to grappling with this in a more rich way. Uh, that being said, storytelling is another one of these forces where you've got folks that want to either explain their research uh, at the university level or in the K-12 level, or they are in a nonprofit organization or agency or a city, county, state, federal, international government agency, and they're saying, look, these web maps are engaging and I can use those to tell my story. But as much as I love having students go to the story map gallery and using them, to make their own. And in, in terms of strategies, that's one of the strategies, is have them do it. Now, I don't really need to say that to you so much because you folks are, again, some of my educational heroes in this, but if you're working with um, others that are sort of, oh, the uninitiated, uh, the, the folks that are just getting into this, I know a lot of well-intentioned educators, but they're the ones that do the geotechnologies in their classrooms or in their youth programs. Out what we are always advocating, right, Susan, Diana, and I, and you folks, Jim, and others, are, yes, that is good that you know this, but get your students to do this. Get them doing this. Absolutely. Lastly, citizen science, being able to gather data out in the field is nothing new, right? The birding community has been doing this for 100 years or so, uh, but being able to map it now, easily map it with editable feature services. In other words, having all of the students that you're working with gather data and push it up into the ArcGIS online cloud and have people being able to access that data that they're gathering, whether it's on invasive species or uh, trash in their community, pedestrian counts, uh, tree species on campus, whatever it is, they are gathering data in the field and they're contributing it in citizen science mode. So I think all of these things are really quite important uh, and have combined to make this, again, the prime time to do this. I don't relish those old clunky days of geotechnologies. Many of you have been around uh, and a while and you know what I'm saying. We have amazing abilities nowadays, so let's seize the moment, right folks? Along that, uh, along that line, I would like to show what I, I believe are the top five skills for geotechnology and STEM professionals that we could think about in terms of how you frame your professional development or your courses or your nature um activities. And one of those, I think, the most important one of the getting students to ask meaningful questions, getting researchers to ask meaningful questions. Many of you advise students at the university level, right? You always want them in their dissertation or their thesis or just a, a semester long project. What questions are you asking? Why are they important? What do you expect to find when you're done with your research? And so on. So asking good questions and starting that inquiry process of, okay, now that I know my question or questions, what data do I need? What methods do I need to use? So that drives us forward in so many areas, right? I mean, you and I have, you know, when you think about the times that we've stayed up late at night trying to, I've got to get this process in my geographic information system to work, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to sleep until I get that thing done, right? So we're very tenacious because not only do we think the technology is useful, but we're, we're ultimately driven by the question that we want to uh, answer or at least grapple with. So getting the students to uh, ask meaningful questions, I think, is an approach that you can use in your professional development uh, education. Uh, secondly, I mentioned this earlier, but being critical of the data, especially nowadays when we have all of these data sets at our fingertips, for example, in ArcGIS Online, the living atlas of the world, right? A growing authoritative body of content. Not perfect, but NOAA, NASA, Census Bureau, United Nations Environment Program, all that data sitting up in this living atlas of the world, great. What do I do with it? What, who, who created it? Why was it created? And so on. And similarly, when they push data up to the online 
web mapping cloud, you want them to populate the metadata as richly as possible, right? They're not going to be metadata kings and queens, maybe, but they, but they're they doing the same thing that we're always preaching, and that is when you when you want to get data, you want it to be richly populated with metadata. And similarly, when you put data out there, even if it's just for your own class, if you're making it public or sharing it with just your group, you need to document why you created it, how you created it, the date, and so on. A blog called Spatial Reserves that is about these very issues because I'm very passionate about, uh, I'm a data geek, and so I'm very passionate about, uh, I used to work for USGS, NOAA, Census Bureau, and so actually on the data creation side of things. So I've always been very interested in uh, spatial data, and I want people to understand its limitations and also its benefits. Uh, thirdly, geographic and geotechnical foundations. You probably thought I was going to mention this first, but I really do think that asking questions is the most important thing. But that said, yes, datum still matter. Yes, map scale still matters. Yes, uh, content knowledge, skills, and a geographic perspective, as you can see here, my three-legged stool, I think they're all important. Sometimes we get pinged for, we're just teaching the tech. No, we've never just taught buffering, for example all by itself. Oh, let's learn how to buffer. It's always in the context of how many cities are within, right, 50 kilometers of the epicenter of this earthquake, or how many water wells with, were within two miles of the landfill, you know, all those sorts of things. We've always been keen on content, skills, and the geographic perspective. But when you're working with your educator colleagues and with students, I think it's a good thing to be reminding them of that you're solving a problem and you need to, if you're, if you're working with, let's say, a set of GIS layers on climate, you need to understand some of how climate systems work. You're not going to be a climate expert in a few days, but you, you need to know if we're looking at ecoregions, for example, what is an ecoregion and how is it related to climate and landforms and latitude and altitude, right? All that sort of thing. So I think these, all three of these are important. Uh, last. Uh, fourth, uh, adaptability, being able to grapple with changes, not just in the technology, but the data, the methods, and so on. So be adaptable, be a lifelong learner, I think is what we need to encourage in these workshops, classes, etc. that you're teaching. Also encourage students to – we're going to take a, a really quick microphone swap, folks, so we can improve the audio quality. All right, folks, how's this? We'll get a little sound check here in the... How's this, folks? Oh. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, folks, um, if, if you're able to hear this, I hope you can. But the last one is good communications. How do we encourage students to communicate the results of their investigation. They may be very good technically, right? They may be good at gathering data in the field with rigorous methods, but how do they communicate that? So I think these are some good things to keep in mind as you conduct your own courses. Okay, I also wanted to share a couple of other things here. And is I encourage you you to teach the platform, teach that GIS is, it's mobile, it's web, it's desktop. Uh, um, it's not just one little segment. And these web apps are not just floating out in free space, right? They actually are connected to a geodatabase. They have power. They, they have attributes. and you can do analytics on them. We're about visualizing patterns, relationships, 
and trends in oceans, but guess what? We don't it's like the uh, ecoregion over here is less impacted by population uh, density than this ecoregion. Well, we can actually figure out, okay, what ecoregions are the densest, densest settled in a, the Ganges in India, for example. So we can use quantitative methods. Um, that being said, I still think place-based education is critical. I think topophilia is still important. Uh, the sense of place, building community. So it's it's all good. Okay, but remember, we're we've got we do have some some analytical capabilities at our fingertips. Also, I wanted to mention that I th think you should uh, using this geospatial technology competency courses, getting people to see, for, for example, this personal effect competencies at the bottom here are you are you ethic are you pausing okay are you a professional are you dependable can you deal with data uh, um, those sort of things are important even moving up to the academic competencies yes geography mathematics and the things that we've been talking about but also writing reading all these other things that are on the academic competencies and then working up through the workplace competencies. But I, I like to start with that tier one and because this uh, came out of a NSF grant to community colleges that I know several of you worked on with me, um, I think it's rigorous and it's, it, it's vetted and it, look, these are skills competencies need to have as they the workplace. So it's another thing to focus on. Also, I would also recommend that if you are thinking about teaching your your professional development workshops, your continued work with, with youth, that you think about the following items. If you only have a half an hour, what would you do? If you only have a day, what would you do? If you only had five minutes with some administrator, what would you do? So the following items are things that I'd like to share, again, not the end-all, be-all but things that I've done in the past that I've actually learned from many of you and your colleagues over the years. First of all, I'd like to say in terms of that is that whenever possible, give a live demo. Now, we are told uh, frequently in professional development literature that you should not do live demos because they could crash. They could crash and burn, and it's better to have pre-canned things. But I'm all about, no, we have to demonstrate what we're preaching, and we have to show live demos wherever possible. Fortunately, it's easy to do that now, or easier to do that, because we do have these web-based uh, capabilities. But just to give you an ex example of some of the things that I almost always do in, in my apps is I almost all uh, several things inside ArcGIS Online. One of which, one of our themes today was uh, STEM Connect, Healthy Living, and Citizenship, all three of those things. And in terms of healthy living and thinking about uh, behaviors, I almost always show this food expenditures by county. The redder right, colors are more eating at home. The bluish are more eating away from home. And because all of the numbers are actually greater than one, there's actually more expenditures of food eaten at home versus away from home. But the closer it gets to one, the more that it's uh, that you're going out more. So it's some interesting patterns, and it's real-world data. So you've got some uh, things that are expected, some things unexpected. If I'm in the middle of the panhandle of Nebraska, you know, there's not a whole lot of eating out options, if you know what I mean. If I'm 50 miles from Valentine, Nebraska, I'm going to eat more at home. But that that breaks down in the middle of Nevada, for example. If you look at some of, you know, Wyoming, Colorado, Nevada, uh, there's actually less food eaten at home than the Great Plains. Interesting. And if we zoom in, right, scale matters. We see different patterns when we zoom in. If we zoom in, we're going to start and ask the students, what's your hypothesis as we zoom in and start seeing metro areas? As we start seeing metro areas, the metro areas are going to start showing up in blue. In other words, people eating out more in metropolitan areas versus in rural areas. Well, hopefully students will have some dialogue with you on, on this. We're getting some big delays, so I'm, I'm pausing a bit. Okay, there you go. So you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, look at Minneapolis, Kansas 
city, Chicago, Denver, for example. Being out. But if you zoom in, you're going to see this reversal again. So central cities, more at home, home sort of inner ring suburbs eating out more, rural areas in, in, in the home more. Fascinating. All kinds of things we in terms of this. So this is one of the, the my go activities. I almost always use this in different contexts uh, because it touches on health, it touches on uh, you could bring in farmers market, could bring in restaurant data, cafes, etc. into this. So how would I do that? Well, if you had a little spreadsheet of, for example, certain kinds of um, data, for example. between those. Another related one that I'm not going to spend time doing, but you've probably seen this too. There's another ArcGIS online map, uh, the distance to the nearest grocery store, right? So that whole thing about food deserts and access to fresh food and so on and so forth. That's one of the reasons why I love coming to Cornell. Just yesterday, there was a local, basically a farmer's market inside the library here, folks, where we taught a GIS workshop. What's not to love? So this is almost uh, something I almost show all the time in, in, in most of my work. Shops. Another go-to one for me is looking at demographics. So if I look at demographics, for example, one of the ones that I almost always show is you demographics for schools version two, USA demographics for schools two v two. So this one, the reason why I like that is is several. It it shows the different patterns at different scales. It also has a nice, neat set of 12 or so variables in it. Uh, my colleague Charlie Fitzpatrick put this one together. So it's not too much. It's not just gives them enough to, to dig into, to chew on, but and with loads of data. More is not always better, which is in here in the in the in the today. Um, what I almost always show here is the relationship of median age to uh, median income. I love looking at median age because you see some wonderful patterns and you can really start asking. In age, for example, the, well, if you're working with fourth graders, if you're working with fourth grade and maybe 12 or 13, just because the but talk to them first you foundation on what is a median and uh, that's all being it's all good so if we look at median age yep we're pausing while the uh, bandwidth catches up to us I'm going to turn on in age turn off the population density and at the state scale we can see that as you'll see Utah Alaska Idaho are younger than the mean of the entire um, uh, USA. Do we have data for other countries? Yes, we have some regional data too, but I'm just focusing on the US at the moment. It would be nice to have a legend here, so let's pop up that legend. No, not all states are creating the beauty of using geotechnologies to look at spatial patterns. If we zoom in, which we will in a moment, first we'll look at New York State. So it's the U.S. average, the, the mean of the U.S. is 37. This is uh, 2012 uh, data in this case. New York is ever so slightly older than that, but you can see this nice histogram as I hover over these. You can see the breakdown. But as you know, there are patterns operating at different scales, a larger scale, for example. So why is New York a little bit older uh, than Utah, but a little bit younger than Maine? You can talk about all sorts of things. Migration, Sunbelt, economics. Uh, in so as, as we zoom, see some interesting patterns at the county level. And if we zoom in and start still far, we're going to see them up at census tract level. So one of the things that brings down a median age, we could talk about university campuses. We could talk about military bases. We could talk about prisons. Um, all of these things act to depress or mean, bring down the median age, right? So I, I like to ask the students 
this would be naturally. It's, it's got to be a little younger than the surrounding because A, we know that not every C, even at this scale, you can start seeing these patterns. I, I, I'm hovering over uh, this community right now, and I see there's a, a, a spot of red, which is the 27 years and younger. And if we zoom in still far, we're going to be able to see some neighborhood patterns that we wouldn't see at a, a small scale. So scale matters. Variables matter. Uh, looking at the relationship of median age to median income to the diversity to uh, tapestry. I love looking at the tapestry data as well, showing students, okay, um, who buys diet iced tea? Who goes running? Who buys lottery tickets? Who commutes to work by bus, uh, etc.? All of those rich things um, are, are wonderful. Okay, so here we're looking at Ithaca and the different ages of, in this case, block groups. So this is the neighbor data. Interesting. So without grinding this one into the ground, take a look at this sometime, think about using it in your own workshops if you're not already using it. Another one of my go-to lessons and activities, I almost always map some sort of natural hazard. Okay, so I do this for several reasons. One, it's, it's frequently in the news, right? It's one of our key 21st century They are operating scales and sometimes I, I map floods in that community or they're, or they're in the news. So another reason why I like using the hazards data is because oftentimes it's, it's available in, in real time or near real time, right? So if I look up, for example, plates for types, I'm going to see my boundary, and let's say a plate boundary map of the world, and let's say I want days of earthquakes, right? I almost always do this, and it always do, okay, the relationship of hazards to people, to coastlines, asking questions like, well, if an earthquake happened in the ocean, no big deal, right? And hopefully the students will say, well, wait a minute, what about tsunami? Diaries, uh, with your teachers especially but also with students. Um, okay, questions, comments at this point. We're getting some delay in the, in the uh, web connection over here, so I just I don't want to blaze through without you actually seeing what I'm going through. Anybody have any pertinent issues that they'd like to raise? Mm -hmm. how, would workforce, how would workforce readiness relate to these forces? forces of yep. Yeah, very good. Uh, how, how are force and the force relate to these five forces, the five we talked about earlier? Well, I'd say a couple things. Uh, a, while the, the GIS jobs are growing, where you actually have G the title of GIS technician or GIS, they are growing at a modest pace. What I see happening in the workforce is that the the people that apply GIS in biology, in dem, in demographic studies, in sociology, even in business, in health, you know, medical medical uh, fields, are growing at an even faster pace. So let's working for uh, UPS, let's say, you're probably not going to be a GIS analyst, but they're probably going to ask you, hey, can you develop a, a, a mapping sort of app where our drivers can actually have it on their phones or in some sort of device, a tablet, out in their vehicles to help them more efficiently, not just find places, but, but route, okay, if, if I'm delivering to tools are, are more highly in demand. And based on what I was saying about geo awareness and geo enablement and mobile technologies, those are the kinds of things. If the students also, on a related note, have any sort of coding skills, so nurture those. Python, a little bit of JavaScript. They don't have to be full time web developers. Uh, I spent about two years in that world. It was great, but 
that wasn't what I wanted to do for my whole career. So, but but knowing a little bit about some HTML coding uh, will be very handy. For example, you know, for me in the education sphere, um, knowing a little bit of that helped me develop up a couple of story maps, my, my captions, so I'd actually be able to point to student work in those captions. So I had to know a little bit about HTML in that case um, to enhance what I was doing educationally. Ditto for you know medical, health, uh, uh, business, engineering, bio, climate, research, etc. There's a lot of people here that are interested in uh, agriculture, soils, uh, environmental issues. So I would say based on all tool belt and not necessarily be a GIS professional are all relevant. So let's say we're, ba we're back here on play boundaries. We're going to go ahead and find the map. Yeah. usgs.gov and if we go to earthquakes that's where real-time earth feeds are in spreadsheet format I think one of the goals you as a geo sites where you have to the data acquisition part is easy I know I'm sort of the dream world you're me, Joseph. Sometimes we have data, and true, we still do. We're not at the point where every single data set that we want is right at our fingertips. But increasingly, this kind of thing, where you're looking at the past 30 days, and let's say we look at the magnitude two and a half, I'm going to copy the link to my plate boundary. And what we're going to be able to do is add those earthquakes to our plate boundary web map. Ditto for fires, floods, other things. I'm going to create a quick heat map as I pause while your view catches up. And so even at this scale, what I can do is say, okay, here are the last 30 days. We said two and a half and above in magnitude. And what would change the base map to something like grayscale so we can see the patterns a little better? So let's go ahead. How about this light gray canvas? All right, super. Let's say you're teaching anything to ha that has to do with energy extraction. That spot in Oklahoma, is that related to energy extraction? If so, how? If so, is it a problem? If so, were there earthquakes in Oklahoma 10 years ago? Or is this a recent phenomenon? Those are the kinds of things that we can investigate with these tools at our fingertips. So I've just made a, a quick heat map, right? But you know, as well as I do, that you've got the ability to ch change the style. So now we can go to magnitude, amount size, so of content, and I open up I'm interested in finding out where that those seven and a halfs are located. And in order to do that, I need to get to the table and then sort it. Or I could do a query. I could do a filter, right? But right now, I'm going to sort, and I'm going to sort descending. The biggest earthquake in the last 30 days is at, and there it is, October 26th. And it looks like it was over in Afghanistan. That was the one that was actually in the news. So let's go ahead and go to center on selection. There it is, right there at this location. So there's the optics. Were there any aftershocks in that area? Go ahead and zoom in and out. It looks like 
there were, were lots of e we can in the, there before the big, big one or after the big module attribute as we go support powerful things that I almost always do in workshops. I would create on some of the live demos. But try to engage the students in some sort of dialogue, and so you're set of curiosity. Um, a couple of other things that I want to do all is um, a couple of things that have to do with how would you approach this. I do enjoy um, work. The dialogue needs to extend beyond this this workshop today, but I have a document. Called matters. And so I've got some better speeches that have acted in 60 seconds of how you might frame your dean is in the elevator with you or your school principal why are we doing this? And again, love to hear your ideas as well. These are just things that I, I frequently come back to and use. Another thing that I'd like to share is geotechnology. Um, core tenets. Um, yep. And Unfortunately, I just closed it, but all right, so this is sort of a, it's not the culmination because I'm not done revising this. Like all these sort of living and breathing documents, I'm going to keep improving this uh, as time goes forward, but it's a guideline for educators and others in your own professional development institutes, in your own, own courses, this. Things you could do if you only had an hour, if you only only had a day. So here are the different uh, as while well, you all get there. But strategies, uh, hang on, make an inquiry, then, you know, a lot of these things are going to be common sense, but uh, some core messages, um, modeling best educational practice, career connections, uh, some key uh, technology messages as the technology rapidly evolves, some philosophies behind this, um, if you're teaching a workshop institute course, what kind of materials, what kind of data would you use? What kind of hardware would you use? Um, if you're teaching in a lab, right, we're increasingly moving to the bring your own device model, but there are still labs and there are still concerns if they bring their own device. What, what 20 considerations in setting up your own training, top 20 GIS skills, and also top 10 educational objectives that using GIS can foster. So, again, not pearls of wisdom, but the accumulated uh, experience in working with you and your educational colleagues over the years. So I would encourage you to take a look at this uh, core tenets in GIS, conducting work. Also, oh yeah, I can totally share this. In fact, it's online, but yep. Also, um, I'd like to demonstrate and talk about a couple of other things that actually have to do with getting students outside, which I know many of you are passionate about. And There's a couple of key things here, but um, some things, if I have even a half a day with educators or students, we do some sort of short activity, right? I know you guys are living and breathing that too. You get them outside, you sort of data, it doesn't have to be with the collector app. You know, there are, there, there's a time and place for, I, I'm, I'm all about using the most appropriate tool for the job. Sometimes it's doing GPS drawing. You know, it's fun. I, I drew some geeky, as you can see here, GIS uh, tracks on the landscape, and you have to think spatially. That's what I love about it. And it has to be big enough letters where you can actually see it when you map it, right? So they can't draw, if they draw their last name or their first name, they can't make the Uh, your discussion about accuracy and precision. Another one that I, I do a lot is I, I look at existing geocaching 
you don't have to set up your own bot that are out there. The one that's from the Smithsonian is one of my favorites, uh, National Mall in DC to, to do it. But look, you can take those ideas and create one for your own community, right? Uh, Esri is partnered with uh, a company called Mapillary, and I've created a few of these. Basically, you love Street View, like I love Street View. You can create your own on a trail, like I did here. So you've got owners. The students have contributed to the Mapillary um, global data set of, of these. Um, and I'm all like you folks, in meeting different disciplines. So I wrote a book called Spatial Mathematics. There's a lot more activities and ideas in there. It's not the end-all, be-all, but I'm getting those math educators in your community uh, moving forward with the geotechnology. Uh, there's lots you can do there. Measuring the dispersion, for example, around given latitude and longitude, having the students go to a lat long, and okay, now let's map where you have, you know, 42 north, 77.5 west, and where did you have 42 north, 77.5 west? And then, okay, and let's map all those positions where we're actually in our own either phone app or GPS unit and then map the dispersion. Um, of latitude, and then you calculate how far it is around the whole circumference of the Earth. Love having students actually in a textbook and memorizing it for the test. You know, I love to have them do like Eratosthenes and others did, actually uh, calculating it out. Again, how what they're over the over the last week. So is really interesting to do. Obviously, with this kind of thing, you have to be sensitive to, um, I, am I going to share that with the whole world? Hmm, maybe not. Maybe I just share that particular web map with my own organization or with a group inside that organization. So be sensitive about what you're uh, actually sharing. And this is, uh, for example, my walks at one of our professional development institutes. Uh, every morning, I'd walk at a different route and mapped it at the end of the Uh, create a story around geocaching or made a big silver uh, map in the 11 and says it was lost uh, or destroyed uh, in the whole Carthage, you know, Phoenician era, but uh, I made up a story that you, you've got clues. It's actually been found and you have to go find it. Um, and so the story is the, the copy of this Silver, uh, who afraid Chad from a 1948 SO map from the restroom floor on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and so the story is not just go to this location, the coordinates, or find the clue, but it's actually uh, they're uncovering clues on the back on the actual story, and then I have a challenge activity at the end where they actually go to you know question number five, three in your answer, and then assemble a clue at the uh, a clue at the end, and the Garden of Humanity is X. Uh, then I also have an answer key so that you can actually use it. Um, and you can open space uh, place that's gone, and other people can use it because it's sitting out there publicly shared. Another thing that's I think really engaging in terms of outdoor activities is comparing smartphones versus a GPS uh, or comparing different smartphone as you're walking around. So comparing a fitness app versus a sort of a GIS GPS app and seeing which is more accurate. As I did, you can see that at some points my line uh, is more space. The, um, the pale yellow line is actually better. Interesting. Uh, here's a topic comparing two smartphone apps in the field. Uh, in this case, I compared Run with Motion X GPS, RunKeeper being the fitness app. And using spatial accuracy as a teachable moment, so I'm very keen on let's, know, let's use the messiness of data. So when you first go out with your GPS, because you've only got one 
it's visible. So ditto with your phone. So map those as I did here. It wasn't for about five minutes where it said, okay, Joseph's walking around this reservoir. The first several minutes, uh, believe me, I did not walk across people's lawns in this crazy pattern on these streets. Uh, um, here, my GPS track was about five years off. But then when we say off, get the students to think about, well, what about the image? They're so used to thinking of certain layers as the truth. Well, there are distortions in imagery, right? They're not exact in terms of, right, we don't have a, a, a GPS or a, a benchmark at every single pixel that's registering these to real ground coordinates. They've all been flown in satellites or, or airplanes, right, and they've been geo-rectified, and they've been mosaic and so on. So there were, there were quality standards. There's some other outdoor-related, geotech-related apps that I, I frequently use in, in these workshops. Uh, snap to map I made one yesterday. Didn't have time to show it at the workshop. <laughs> but um, creating a story map in the field while you're on your phone is effective because it's quick. It's not all that rigorous, but it's, it's fast. And students see that, oh, yeah, fun. It's easy. I'm thinking spatially. Uh, field notes, learning about your location's geographic characteristics characteristics and how it compares so in terms of climate, bio, uh, biodiverse annual temperature, um, rainfall, uh, land use, nearest natural hazard, uh, nearest earthquake epicenter in the last 50 years. And then finally the collector one, okay we're actually going to collect data in citizen science mode on a phone and then map it and analyze it. Some other resources I'll just mention here, I've got one called Seven Ways to Map Your Field. Uh, so how do you merge these species? And so uh, I was assigned the task of briefly mentioning um, some of the things that that youth can do, okay? So let's go over there briefly. And there is a S3 key GIS organization that probably many of you are familiar with. It is uh, basically s3url.com slash k12gis. And it has these resources that you can see here. Instructional doc documents below forth, but one of them is Video Bonanza. So the video, one of, you know, basically the set of our favorite youth created videos or youth videos. One of them um, is youth video links at the top, as you'll see in a moment. But these are videos of the GIS users from the S3 user conferences. Go back, going back to 2009. I love these because these students, you know, they're talking to 15, 16,000 people. They're all very poised. It's sort of the, the sort of the epitome of wonderful work that students are doing. I don't just show those though, because oftentimes those are like you know semester-long or year-long projects, and I don't want students or educators to think, you know, I don't have I don't have months to spend in the field. You know, the reality is I've got you know two hours per week or an hour per semester or whatever it is. Um, so don't just show those. Yes, they are wonderful, but they're not. The, I think they're very good because you've got a whole wide range of age ranges in there, um, types of schools, city, inner city type schools. You've got students working in environmental ed centers. You've got people from the East program in Arkansas, um, which were these girls. Uh, uh, they were. Uh, fourth graders up there on the stage uh, hanging out with Jack Dangerman. Here we had two uh, juniors and seniors uh, from high school that were looking at um, a variety of things on the island of uh, Molokai. So show those, but don't just show those. There's other videos in this video area. And um, I've got, for example, some video in this number five. I've got of videos about GIS 
our students actually in GIS. Not that many because of the whole permissions thing required, so mostly me um, talking about how this all matters and why it matters. But anyway, take a look at these. I typically in a multi-day workshop, stepping down to number seven, I almost always show the trailer for the geospatial revolution. I still think it's relevant and engaging and it's wonderfully done and produced from Penn State. Can I say Penn State here at Cornell? They're good people down there too. They're good people. Um, but if you have more time, assign one or two of those to the students and okay, come back to class tomorrow having watched episode one. But the trailer is only five minutes long and it's quite engaging. Um, also, we do have some case studies out there on, on the Ed Community site. So if I go to edcommunity.esri.com, we've sitting there. Um, in the few moments that I've got, let me just highlight that uh, you I before I community and all kinds of uh, 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 social issues and problems uh, comes to mind. And then about it is that these students that are working with HOPE um, are engaging in several different technologies to blaze a career pathway. What, what they're doing is web, video, uh, and, and software as a service, in this case uh, for the current year they're, they're, they're concentrating on building skills with uh, Salesforce, which is a web-based uh, sales and marketing tool uh, that many businesses use, including us at Esri, by the way, and GIS. So one of the projects that they've got going on right now, they've actually got a contract with the American Water Works Association, which works in tandem with uh, municipal water um, authority, water infrastructure in Camden. So water mains, uh, fire hydrants, valves, and so they're out in the field, they're collecting data, they're mapping it, and the works people, they don't have the staff to do it, and the students did such a good job with their pilot, the water works people are giving them more, and guess what, they're actually paying them to do it. And so the students can actually get internships with the Water Works Association uh, in their own community and beyond. Um, and perhaps a job, but even if they don't work there, they're gaining key skills, right, about being organized, field work, data assessment, quality, Love it. Mastering job skills for five-year-old underemployed or un unemployed youth. And I like it for several reasons, but I'll just feature one of them. They have a nice, because of their name, it's sort of a, a implied, but a nice integration of the A in STEAM or STEM. And so one of the projects, to, to, just to name a single project, uh, we used, they used GIS to figure out where glass recycling bins would be located uh, throughout Denver. So they had this project, we're going to start these glass recycling bins bins, we're going to deploy them. We only have 10, where are we going to place them in Denver? So they used GIS to figure out where they should be deployed. And then I think equally or even better than that actually is that the students film videos at the recycling bins because they painted them. So the students are filming, why did they paint what they painted? How, what colors I chose? What theme am I trying to get across in my painting that is in, in, encasing this, this recycling bin? So the story map is the students, their own voice, beside the recycling bin. They have ownership. They ha they're, you know, have good pride in their work. It's just one of those, yes, we need to do this more of uh, type of project. So. Um, those are just a couple of projects that I wanted to mention. Folks are are doing very good things with uh, youth and community, and so I wanted to just put this back up so you know how to get a hold of me. I, I'm hoping that was valuable. It was kind of a, a you know a sort kind of a smorgasbord 
try to focus on what are some approaches, some of STEM connections, uh, what youth can do. Joseph, Questions, thank you very much for that. And uh, we do have, we have had a few people type in some questions here. I apologize for the issues with the audio and the slow video delay on this. Um, I, I think Joseph has shared a lot of information and we will be making the recording of this available, but also all of those links as well that you might not have been able to catch along the way and uh, the handouts that Joseph referred to. Joseph, one person has um, asked about access to ArcGIS. Is that something that you can just touch on briefly? How is it that, that all the educators you're, you've been speaking to would get access to ArcGIS? I'm not hearing everything that you're saying. In yeah, I'm not hearing everything that you're saying in here. So I, I that would be great. I Thank you. People are not as well. Your full question. Yeah, how do we how do we access ArcGIS uh, online, desktop, etc.? But focusing on uh, online, or is it all ArcGIS? Okay, let's start with ArcGIS online. Um, you being educators of youth, you have access if you're in a school to the um, Connect Ed program, connected.esri.com, connected or connected.esri.com. Um, you can sign up public, private, homeschool uh, for a free organizational subscription. Now let me just have a little side note. There are things you can do inside ArcGIS Online without an organizational subscription. You can look at biomes versus ecoregions versus population change natural hazards, but if you want to save maps and create things like story maps, you really do need an account. And to take advantage of the analytical tools, you really do need an organizational subscription. So that's one way to get it. The other way is through 4-H. Um, and we've got a 4-H program that we've ran since, what, 2002, 2004? And reminding me, Susan Haas, reminding me that in New York you've got a statewide um, organizational subscription. It's a nice place to start. I mean, to start there, make some maps, play around in the sandbox, and then I'm all I'm a firm believer in, you know, yeah, look at these videos and these wonderful projects, but but there's a place for you to start small. So if you're just getting into this and you feel like, oh gosh, this is like a smorgasbord of uh, you know, drive-through frozen yogurt, but it's drive-through GIS. Uh, you don't have to, it's like you can't learn chemistry in a, in a week, right? It's, it's that sort of mindset. Just start small, dip a toe into the shallow end of the pool, and you get some good people all around you here in New York to help you out. The book resources. Uh, uh, I'm going to pause for. Okay, okay here are the here are the book resources. Um, okay, we're we're so. Diana has asked me, given our little audio issues here, to close it out. I'd love to have her give her final parting thoughts. Do you want to step over here and do that? Hold on, folks. We've got uh, one group microphone that's going on here. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, apologize for the uh, unexpected audio and visual challenges that we had, but we did record things, and Joseph, of course, is going to make uh, the all of the resources that he has talked about here, we're going to make those available, and um, for those of you in the New York State 4-H community, you know you've got a great team of leaders, uh, some of whom are here at Cornell, interested in supporting your activities, and if you have any follow-up questions to this, things you've been inspired by, please reach out. To the group here, Susan Hoskins is one of your primary contacts, and we'll make sure that um, that the group is going to be able to support what you're interested in doing. So thank you again very much for joining us, um, and enjoy the sunshine that's out there in New York State today. Bye-bye. Thanks.